Now go ahead and turn with me. We're going to jump right in. Uh, I'm going to have Bibi to read some for me this morning because I want to cover, uh, try to cover qu quite a bit of this. Uh, the reason being is we're leading up to some stuff. And really, if you was going to title the message today, and really probably the next two weeks, maybe three weeks, it'd be talking about uh, bread, uh, the bread of life. And um, I want to I share something while she's turning to chapter 6, verse 22 is where we're going to kick off. And if I can find it right quick, I want to share something. Um, it, I, I just, I, sometimes you just Google things and you're just like, okay, there's a lot I know about bread, but maybe I can see something that I don't know. And um, one, and we're going to see this in the text, uh, but bread is, is a gift from God. It, when you see it in the Bible, it's a gift from God. It's how he sustained the children of Israel. And bread had such a huge part in the Middle East culture and in any culture that raises grain and that kind of thing. And, it, and, it's, and it's, it's a gift from God for the people that partake of it, but it's also agriculturally it's a gift from God for the farmers that raise it. And so it's a big part of our life. Uh, I'm talking about on a natural level. We know on a spiritual level, Jesus is the bread of life, and he compared himself to that. Uh, when Moses fed the people in the desert with food which fell from heaven, and also we see that as an example, and we're going to see it in the text, is Jesus also used it as, at the Last Supper. And he went a little deeper. In the text we're going to cover today, we won't get that deep maybe, but, but next week we'll look into it a little more. Um, when Jesus multiplied the bread to feed the crowd, the bread became a sign of sharing. It also symbolizes the Word of God, which nourishes us spiritually. So bread has a lot of meaning to it. Uh, either next week or the following week, we'll be uh, partaking of, the, of communion, the Lord's Supper, and when we do, we'll be talking about what the bread of Jesus, Jesus as the bread, what that really meant to us as believers. But as for today, let's jump right in. Uh, verse 22, John 6, and I'm going to have Bibi to read down to verse 20. Uh, stop it after you read 25, please. That's fine. I don't care. It don't matter. Whichever one, which one you're reading from, New King James? Yeah, that's fine. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered, and Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Okay. Jesus. Oh. That's, that's good. And, and so here, here's the scenario, uh, just to not backtrack a lot, but if you'll remember earlier in John, we've looked at how it said it in that text, how the place where he had gave thanks for the bread. It's interesting to me that the only thing they point out in the text that he gave thanks for the bread. Now, we've already been in that story. There was a lot more to it than Jesus just giving thanks, but I think it, it's the starting point. What did he do with that bread? He took five loaves and two fishes, and he fed approximately 15,000 people. But it started with a thanks. What you get in life and what you receive in the kingdom will start with a thanks. It doesn't start with a bag. God, please do this. No, it starts with thank you, Lord, for being Lord. When you don't have anything else, you begin to thank him for the breath that you're breathing. People say, well, I don't have anything to give thanks about. People that say that don't have a thankful heart. Because when you've got a thankful heart, and I believe you folks do, you'll find something to be thankful of. Amen? If nothing else, you could give thanks this morning for all these beautiful children up here that God's ministering to their life. Amen? So they're asking the question. Not only did, had Jesus in the previous text, he had fed 15, it says 5,000, but you got to realize 5,000 only represented the men. 
They were women and children there, so they estimate a minimum of 15,000. Could have been more, could have been less, but we know for a fact it's 5,000 because it's 5,000 men, but I believe it was probably closer to the 15,000. But it all started when he gave thanks. He gave thanks, and then he began to distribute the bread. I also believe that when he distributed the bread, the Bible doesn't clarify this, but the character of God does. The Bible says the disciples began to hand it out, and it was more than enough. I believe it shows how God wants to work with us. He could have multiplied it by himself. I believe he used the disciples as part of the multiplication, just like he does today. Same character, same God. As we've said many times, we can't do it without God. And God refuses to do it without us. He could. It's a partnership is what I'm saying, and that's what he wants to keep doing. Also in the previous text, and this is where we're at right now, the people said, how did you get here, Jesus? My translation said, how, wh where did you come from? He wasn't on the boat with the disciples. Good question, isn't it? You remember the answer. It was when the sea was rough and they were being tossed to and fro on the Sea of Galilee. And I mean, the storms come up so fierce because it's 650 foot below sea level. So I mean, this thing just came on them. And here comes Jesus at 3 o'clock in the morning walking on water. Uh, get that picture. 3 o'clock in the morning, the boat's about to be turned over. And here he comes walking on the water. And at first they were scared. They said, it must be a ghost. He said, no, it's me. It's me. Peter said, if it is, tell me to come out there. Jesus said, come. And Peter walked on water. Now, I know a lot of preachers and a lot of people over the years, they really give Peter a hard time because he sunk. And they also elaborate that Jesus saved him. I don't disagree with that at all. But I want us to keep focused on the fact he stepped out and walked on water. It's not something to make the story good. He done it. There was a human, two humans. One was son of God and the son of man, Jesus. But then there was all man, Peter. And they walked on the water. How could we doubt that he'd look after us? Amen. Amen. He's got you. Now, Jesus... I'm going to have baby to read. They're asking a question. Not just to back up. They're asking a question... Where did you come from? Now, I want you to listen closely to what Jesus asked them. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do? that we may work the works of God. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. All right, hold on just a second. Now, get this picture. They asked Jesus, where you been? They were trying to locate where he's been, and through the Spirit, he located where they were at. They weren't looking for him just to find out where Jesus was at. They were looking for him because he had fed them. What am I saying? Sometimes we look for Jesus for the wrong reasons. And we don't get what we really need. Make it your heart desire to, to make Matthew 6.33 just a staple in your life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I love simplicity. I'm a simple guy. That tells me if I will seek him, I can go back and read 33 back up all the way to verse 25, and I can find out what he's going to add to my life if I'll just seek him. When I first got that revelation back in 1996, I was like, I'm in. I can do this. I may not do it properly. I may blow it. I may miss it. Thank God for his grace. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it, but I got it. And I can seek him. You say, how do you do that? Well, you're doing it right now. You want to know what he's saying. You'll do it, you'll do it tonight when you pray, or you'll do it uh, tomorrow morning when you get up and have a quiet time with the Lord. You're seeking him. It's not above you. It's not too far out there. 
We church so many times put in religion and made it difficult for people to reach God. God understands any language that you speak. And you can talk to him about anything. And you're not going to catch him off guard. He's all-knowing. He said, look, y'all are looking for me, but the reason you're looking for me is because of the miracle. Now, I, think, I don't know if it said it in the King James. Let me look here just a minute. Um, no, keep on reading. I, I do want to drop down on verse 29 and read from the New Living, and I, I think it's a, pretty close to the same uh, translation here. This is the only work God wants you from you. Believe in the one he has sent. You say, that's all we got to do to get to heaven. Whosoever believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and confesses with his mouth shall be saved. Wow. We've built a lot of buildings. We've done a lot of things to confuse that very simple message, haven't we? I know when I was growing up, people say, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this. What they should have been saying is you get to do this. You get to do this. You get to do this. Jesus said the only thing you've got to do if you want to make heaven your home is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. All the other things are fringe benefits. I get to preach the gospel. I get to, to try to be the right dad, granddad. I get to try to live in his kingdom. When it says seek his kingdom first and his righteousness, you could also insert from the original Greek, you could insert his way of doing things. He has a righteous standard. He has a way of doing things. His way doesn't compare with the way of the world. The simplest revelation I ever received about that was when it came to money. I grew up in a sales background, and all they ever taught us and promoted was sales, money, houses, cars. You got to do this. Set 10 years gold. I, if I ever hear somebody else tell me to set a 10-year gold, I'm going to pop them in the nose. Is all I could do to figure out what I was doing in six months. Ten years was so far out there. I'm like, man, I don't even know what will be going on. Now, am I, am I against that? No, it works for some people. It just didn't work for me. But everything was about money and material things. And listen, God does not have a problem with you having material things. And he don't really care how many material things you have. As long as none of them have you. God would not be offensive. He wouldn't be offended if next Sunday morning everybody out there had a brand new car driving into the church. Wouldn't bother him a bit. But if you took your seed and bought it, it would affect your life. God would still love you and you'd still be going to heaven. We get to do all of this because we're his children. My kids have certain benefits. You, as a child of God, have benefits you can tap into. Chad may, whenever he stops by the house, he's not going to stop at the house. And, he's not going to walk in my kitchen and say, Dad, can I have something to drink? If he does, I'm going to look at him funny. Why? Because it ain't just my kitchen. It's his too. What the Father has is yours. Jesus said, as I am, so are you in this world. He didn't say the next world. When you see a promise of God, he said we're joint heirs together. Everything Jesus acquired on the cross, he gave to you. Well, I, 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 Pastor, that's a little far out there. You, you're saying I have this, the, the power, uh, the authority that Christ, yeah, he said all power has been given to me. Now, therefore, you go. You have authority in this earth. It's been restored. Adam and Eve lost it. Jesus bought it back. You take that rightful authority. It's not an arrogant thing. It's not a, it, listen, it's got really nothing to do with us anyway. It all belongs to us by default that we're his children. This is where people get into ego and pride when they get to thinking it's because they've done something. Oh, the only thing any of us ever done, I don't care what level of authority you walk in, what level of power you walk in, it always comes back to the fact that you're a child of God. It's got nothing really to do with you. 
I've seen people healed where I lay hands on them. And I'll be honest with you, the first couple times it ever happened to me, I didn't have enough faith to even go to the altar to pray for them. I remember one night in particular, this lady had had a hard heart and just would not give her heart to the Lord. And God had ministered to her, and I had ministered to her. And she was just hard-hearted, had been hurt so bad in life. And the man that was teaching that night or preaching that night said, come up front. And through that one experience, that person became a sold-out believer in Jesus Christ. And I was telling the Lord when I was sitting there, please, God, don't make me go up. Please, God. Because they were calling all the ministers up, and I had enough. I didn't, have, I didn't even have the faith I felt like to get up out of the chair and come to the front. And God showed me, boy, it ain't about you. It's about my word. It's about my presence. It's about my spirit. And I never forgot that. Anything you get out of the message today, it ain't about me. It's about what God says through me. And it's the same for you. Amen? So Jesus told them why they was looking for him. Go ahead and pick it up there, baby. Where, where are you at? First what? Yes. Told you when the, when the man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. She said, do you want the NLT? She knew I was having problems Following tracking that. a little That's bit, focusing. Yeah, I've Go gone ahead. back here. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they hold on, journeyed. Hold on just a second. I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> I want you to get this picture. Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What else do you... Here's what I would be saying if I was Jesus. Yeah. What else do you want? You tell me the sign you want. There's two men that have walked on water. We took five loaves and two fish and fed 15,000. What else do you want? Some of their descendants are still around. I've met people. God saved them from a, a car accident or he's, he's done something so supernatural they can't explain. And then all of a sudden it was like, God showed me something else so I'll believe. Get off of that. God showed you 66 books that he's God and he always will be and there's nothing nobody can do about that. We're not looking for signs. We're not believing for confirmation like these people. We've got a confirmation. He's living inside of me. Romans 8, 11 says the same spirit, not one like him, not, a, not a, a, a cousin to him, but the same spirit that went into a barred tomb and raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. Dear God, if that's not a sign, I don't know what is. Jesus Christ, he said, if you'll come to me, I'll make my abode with you. I'll make my home with you. He's not lying. The Christ lives in you. The, through the Holy Spirit. Oh, this is a major revelation that we just skim right over. <laughs> he said, if you'll abide in John 15, 7, if you'll abide in me and my words will abide in you, you'll ask whatever you will and I'll do it. We have a sign, the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. They had signs, but now they're going to bellyache. They want more. Huh. Go ahead and read. After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true, true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. All right, just stop right there. Now, we're going to have to close there, but I want you to get this. The Messiah is standing in front of them. The Christ, the anointed one, his anointing, the son of God, the savior of the world. He's walked on water. His disciple has walked on water. They fed over 5,000 people with a, five loaves and two fish. And now they're pointing to the past. 
with Moses. Now, there is a great biblical principle here that I pray that you can get a hold of th this morning. To go with God the distance, we don't need the past, we need the future. What's God doing right now? Thank God for the past. Thank God for the miracles you've seen. Thank God for bringing you out. It's a true sense of worship when we begin to thank God for all he's done for us. I'm looking around the room. I see many of you that I know, and, and many of you, many of you knew me back then, and I knew you back then. We've come a long ways. Yeah, go ahead and give my hand. Yeah. We've come a long ways, but here's the cool thing about it. <laughs> it was because he brought us. They were still looking to Moses and that old sorry bread that they were having to deal with then. The bread they dealt with then, they murmured and complained about it. What did he do? Here's what the children of Israel said. What did he do? Bring us out here so he could kill us where we don't have no graves? I mean, there's bread falling from heaven every morning. <laughs> God's sustaining them, and they're, they're cursing God. They're not curse words like what we're used to in the Western world, but they're bringing down curses on themselves. They're saying God's not sufficient, and he's feeding them every day. Now they're taking that same experience of their ancestors and saying, yeah, but Moses fed us. And they forgot to remember the whole time Moses was feeding them that it was God. Not only that, they forgot to remember that the whole time God was feeding their ancestors, they was complaining about it. Jesus opens up a new covenant. Oh, I'm going to give you bread. And we ain't even went there yet today. I'll go there and close it. Not only did he feed the 15,000, 5,000, 15,000, whatever it was, we know for sure in the Bible, 5,000. But again, I believe women and children were there, so they estimate a minimum of 15,000. Jesus didn't stop there. He said, now pick up the fragments. They walked away with more than they brought. Now, if you're a tither or an offering giver, you know this to be a fact. You can't outgive God. I know a, 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 a well, Dr. Jerry Savelle, I, I remember his testimony. Carolyn looked at him one day, and this guy was a body man in Louisiana, and God called him to preach, and they had to believe God for spare tires and had to believe God that their tires would stay pumped up. Well, Jerry got a hold of, of sowing and reaping and giving, and his wife looked at him one time. She said, you've got to get, quit giving away cars and motorcycles. We're not building any more garages. <laughs> Think about that. Think about that. You can't outgive God. I remember Thurman Smith back in the back there. Thurman's dad was my pastor when I was a little bitty boy. <laughs> and I made that statement one night in church. I said, you can't outgive God. Thurman come up to me after. He said, I've heard that test. He said, I've heard that all my life. He said, the problem was I grew up in a church that didn't try. So it's not lip service. It's purposing in your heart to be thankful. That little boy gave his lunch. Do you realize how hard that is? He's a lad. What hope has he got to get in another lunch? The mental capacity to say, hey, there's a need. Here's, here's, here's my bread. There's that bread sharing thing. Man, can you imagine? I don't know where his faith is. The Bible don't talk about it, but it must have been pretty, pretty strong because the Bible doesn't say this, but I just know the character of God, and I can't help but believe whatsoever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. The boy sowed his lunch. I'm convinced he took 12 baskets home with him. You say, well, it's not in the Bible. I know. You can't disprove it. I can't prove it, so we'll just leave it at that. But in my heart, I believe that young boy went home with 12, 12 baskets. Why? Because whatever you sow, you're always going to have more than enough. That's why we sow. I don't want just enough. If I have just enough, I can't help nobody. If I've got more than enough, I can help somebody. This church, I give you the whole list there earlier. If we didn't have more than enough, how could we help these people? There's things that happened this week that I didn't go over in the list where we blessed people and done things that if we hadn't had it in the bank, we couldn't have. God's into the more than enough. 
He's not into hoarding. He's not into greed. He's in more than enough so that we can be a blessing. You are blessed to be a blessing. Amen. And I'm going to just close with that because this is one of them times I don't know where to stop, so I'm just going to have to stop. Amen. <laughs> and I'm just going to have to trust the Holy Spirit that you got everything you needed. Amen. Y'all receive this this morning. Church, listen to me as we, as we dismiss. We love you. We thank God for you. And I want to tell you something as the pastor of this church. We're coming up on 18 years. It ain't going to be long till we'll be celebrating it. All my buddies around the country and board and everybody else that speaks into my life tells me the same thing. Pastor, your church is poised to take the community and to really go for it. And I'm telling you, we are. And I'm just thankful that you're a part of it. I'm thankful for those that are up here this morning. They're a part of it. God told me years ago, he said, I'm going to do something in your life. And I asked him to. My prayer was real simple. It's been 18, it's been 20 some years since I prayed the prayer. Well, 18 really since I started the church as well. And I really got serious about the prayer. I don't even, I wasn't planning this. I told the Lord when I started, I said, do something in my life that there'll be no way I can take the credit for it. Man, he is faithful. I can be a part of it, but I can't take credit for it. You're sitting in a debt-free building. There's been over a million dollars raised on this property to do what we do in church. Look around. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money with a handful of people. God done something that I can't take the credit for. But I'm telling you, this next thing he's doing, he's going to raise some of you up. There's going to be people sitting here. I just want to prophesy for a minute. There's some of you sitting here right now. You didn't even know you were a leader in the body of Christ. But God's speaking to you today. That's not, don't you rebuke that, what you're hearing. That's God. That's God. Some of, you, some of you got spoken to when them kids was up here. You're like, I want to be one of them teachers that they remember 20 years later. That's not you. You've sowed your treasures. God's given you the desire of your heart. And he's going to honor your faithfulness. Barry, I don't, I'm not going to put you and Megan on the spot, but I'm going to say something. Barry's one of my closest friends growing up. For years, we've known each other, haven't we? I leaned over at my wife this morning, and I said, I am just so blessed by their faithfulness. I don't know, a couple months now, three months maybe, been coming to this church, and I see them every Sunday come up here. It's not about what they come up here and give. It's about the fact that they're encouraging their pastor by their faithfulness. See, when we are found faithful, we can trust the faithfulness of God. Show me an inconsistent person. Listen to me close, and this is not condemnation. I want you to hear me. I love you. But you show me a person that are, is inconsistent in their walk, and I'll show you a person that has trouble believing God's faithful. And this is, this is a, a psyche thing. This is a psychological thing. This goes all the way to husband and wife. If, if one can't trust the other one, they don't feel trustworthy themselves. But our psyche, we wonder why, how we're going to get more faith. And all I'm telling you is all you got to do is become faithful. Faithful to what? Anything God is doing. And the next thing you know, your faith is going to grow. There's great faith coming into your life, both of you. Great faith. I believe that with all my heart. I don't, I don't do this, and my team will tell you, I don't just start speaking over people unless the Holy Spirit tells me to. But you're going to have great faith because of your faithfulness and because of God's Word. God is faithful, church. God is faithful. And you're faithful. I mean, I, God gave me the Word for Barry and Megan, but I know that applies to many of you in here. And maybe some of you in here it don't apply to, but today it does apply to you. Because God's saying, child, come on, get faithful. I want to show you my faithfulness. And it's not that God's withholding it. Listen to me. 
God's not withholding his faithfulness. What it is is our capacity to believe that he's faithful. My faithfulness or lack of doesn't change the character of God, but it does change my capacity to believe God. Amen. Amen. 